today we are going to look at john dryden so far we have seen aristotle plato sir philip sidney and ben johnson now dryden appeared on the english scene somewhere around 16 in the restoration age all right so you could say that he was a restoration dramatist and he excelled at uh, you know at writing plays he is basically known as an english poet literary critic translator you know he made a name for himself translating various uh, greek and roman works and playwright so he wrote plays of his own he was a first poet laureate so we know all these poet laureates who came subsequently um it would be good to know that he was the first poet laureate made uh, the poet laureate in around 1668 um he lived during the restoration england as you would well know it was followed by um cromwell's reign and uh, during charles the second's uh, restoration england was uh, getting a fresh whiff of uh, fresh breath of air you could say the english stage was getting a fresh breath of air so the dramatists of that time had a more uh, um more freedom to write right and well quite a few of them excelled he was known more for his uh, for his more popular works twenty others actually I've just mentioned the three that are often repeated in the english syllabus now the main critical works his uh, these were his literary works as such his creative works creative writing but as far as his critical works are concerned they go for pages actually um but definitively speaking it was merely one work that he wrote as criticism per se an essay on a dramatic poetry the rest of them were merely overall prefaces i shouldn't put it bullet point here um it's just an indication that all of these no everything that follows the preface here would be the prefaces of various works his own works sometimes sometimes translations of others other writers so an essay on dramatic poetry is the only critical independent critical writing of his the rest of them the rest of the works are merely prefaces okay so he had preface to epistle ded- dedicatory to the rival ladies a preface to dedication to anis mirabilis a defense of an essay of dramatic poetry uh, of heroic plays it's the conquest of granada it's uh, the conquest of granada part 1 was one of the plays for which he wrote of heroic plays so and then epilogue and epilogue and the defense of the epilogue for the conquest of granada part 2 it was written as a preface to the conquest of granada part 2 the apology for heroic poetry for the state of innocence of the grounds of criticism in tragedy as a preface to Troilus and Cressida and then of a discourse concerning in the the original and progress of satire as a stars of juvenal for the prof, uh, as preface to the satires of juvenal and uh, a panel of poetry and painting for dufres noise the art graphica the dedication of the aeneis or aeneid as a preface to the translation of virgil's works and preface to the fables as um, as in he had a collection of tales from homer ovid boccaccio and chaucer so his style of criticism was mainly suitable because see when he wrote these prefaces he did not really have one particular object in mind on which to write about right so for instance if a, a, a criticism aristotle aristotle would write on on the nature of, of, of the po- poetry or function of poetry or he, he wrote it in different pieces and sometimes he mixed them all together again ben johnson's notes were fragmented at best he wrote whatever he um, you know whatever thought that appeared to him right but when you look at sydney he had a proper uh, you know proper structure of writing he structured his criticism bit by bit right 
So he started off with the defense of he started off with how uh, poetry was crucial for the civilization, and he um, you know started defending um, each each uh, each attack laid upon poetry itself, the genre of poetry itself by Gosson Stephen Gosson in his School of Abuse, right? Here we see Dryden uh, writing just about everywhere on anything but it does not mean that he wrote haphazardly okay so he learned his method of critical writing from Montaigne and Cornell as in these were the writers or more prominently essays and critics of their time um, and their writing is something that he was impressed with and he followed he followed their method he did not it did not this kind of writing criticism did not limit his choice to one subject for any length of time so for instance if he is writing about heroic couplets in one particular preface so he did not restrict himself to that alone he could go on uh, continue with something else something else that concerns the work in question okay work in question as in the work for which he is writing the preface all right so he could look into various different components within the play or the work he's translating um into and comment upon it rather than stick to merely one subject so it did not restrict limit his choice to one subject for any length of time did not require him even to exhaust the subjects exhausted subject is in he need not just tell everything he has to tell about that subject in that particular preface alone. He could go on and write further commentary in a, some other preface to, uh, you know, for another writing. So what happened, you could find bits and pieces of wisdom about a certain subject in different works of his, different essays of his, or what we call essays or professes of his. All right. So um, it he... Uh, it committed him in his judgments only to the occasion in hand and to no others. So what would happen, whatever he is concerned with at that particular time, he would talk about that alone. All right. So for instance, uh, say, um, apology for heroic poetry. So if he is talking about the apology for, for about uh, heroic poetry as uh, while writing, uh, writing as preface to the state of innocence, he would not he would be concerned only with this particular work okay this particular work or the various components pertaining to this particular work he not concern himself with the other genres of poetry other forms of poetry all right so that way he need not limit himself he need not exhaust himself of the subject he did not commit himself in his judgments only to the occasion he he can only commit his judgments only to the occasion in hand so, for instance, he says that he a certain, um, you know, verse has to have only these many meters. He he can allude only to the particular circumstance rather than generalize it. All right. So he is safer that way. Again, left him no scope to discuss more than one subject at a time. So what happens is he can talk about any number of things at the same time. All right. It, not, it did not limit at the same time. It provided enough scope for him to talk about any kind of subject under the sun. Right. And moreover, it afforded opportunities for personal explanations. Personal explanations as in he could talk about, uh, you know, any he could defend himself in any way he wanted in any of the professors. He need not restrict himself to whatever subject he takes up. So, for instance, if he is taking up one particular work, the essay on dramatic poesy. He can only talk about dramatic poesy alone. He cannot go about talking about other forms. Like he cannot talk about heroic plays or, or heroic tragedy or he cannot talk about heroic couplets. He cannot talk about uh, fables. He cannot talk about uh, the uh, the um, epilogues or anything for that matter. So he can you know he can give personal explanations he can uh, necessitated by the attacks on his works it provided opportunities for him
flaws in his style of criticism. His criticism is made to look unsystematic, inconsistent, repetitive, and interested. Now, when we say unsystematic, of course, it is scattered all over. So, it is not systematic in, uh, in nature. Uh, you have to find, um, say, if you're talking about one particular um, aspect, one particular genre, you have to subgenre. You'd have to look into all of his professors if he has mentioned them anywhere else. So it is not systematically put in together. It is inconsistent in the sense sometimes he may um, he may proffer certain opinion about one particular uh, work at the same time work or method at the same time uh, again at another point of time he may uh, resign his opinion resign his opinion as in he he may take back his opinion and may offer something uh, that would have struck his uh, you know thought at that time not fancy thought at that time so it is inconsistent it is not consistent throughout and moreover it is repetitive sometimes because he seems to be Telling what he has already told, you know, in, in, a, in a certain work he must have told. And maybe he felt that it needs to be better explained, might have gone through the same topic again. It seems interested, his criticism makes it look interested in, biased, a little prejudiced. Eames in his critical writing, he advocated the use of heroic couplet for dramatic purposes. As in he, um, his... He advocated the use of dramatic heroic couplet. Heroic couplet, I hope you're familiar with heroic couplet. Uh, heroic couplet, so basically, um, a pair of rhyming iambic pentameters. Okay, there are iambic pentameters that rhyme. If they do not rhyme, they would be blank verse, right? So, heroic couplets, uh, he advocated or the um, uh, use of heroic couplet that is rhymed iambic pentameters for dramatic purposes. He felt they were the best. Preference for four line stanzas with alternate rhyme to the heroic couplet for heroic verse. So he uh, advocated the use of four line stanzas, that each stanza should have four lines, of which one or uh, two would have with alternate rhyme to the heroic couplet for heroic verse to create heroic uh, verse here. He's, and he uh, advocated this particular practice. Defended the use of the rhymed couplet in tragedy against Sir Robert Howard's objection. Sir Robert Howard seems to have objected to the use of rhymed couplet in tragedy. Uh, well, he had his basis on the fact that uh, he felt, that is Sir Robert Howard felt that um, use of rhymed couplets for tragedy made the tragedy a little less tragic and more frivolous. So Dryden defended the use of rhymed couplet in tragedy. A few other themes in his critical writing. He eulogized Milton's achievement in creating Paradise Lost. If, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Dryden used Milton's Paradise Lost to write his own play that was uh, supposed to have been performed as an, uh, as an opera. But yes, it was called The State of Innocence. Okay, For The State of Innocence, he used Paradise, uh, Paradise Lost as his basis. So he was, uh, you know, he was awed by Milton's achievement in creating Paradise Lost. And he also um, used to work on the theories of Aristotle's theory of uh, tragedy and, uh, and used it to examine the achievements of Shakespeare and Fletcher as well. Uh, and he also discussed epic poetry with reference to Virgil, the, the Roman poet. Um, and also he appreciated Chaucer. So he basically uses his used his writing for appreciation of uh, certain certain uh, great poets and writers like Shakespeare, Fletcher, Chaucer, Milton and also tried to discuss certain genres like uh, epic poetry and um, certain forms like uh, heroic couplet and use of certain forms and certain uh, in particular genres. Yeah, so these were the major themes of his critical writing, recurring themes of his critical writing. Now, his prime concerns were of nature of poetry, function of poetry, poetic forms, business of criticism, the masters he was interested in, 
and he combined both native and the class, native tradition and the classical and establish a connecting connection between his creative and critical works so so these were his prime concerns so he was basically concerned with the nature of poetry okay what is poetry made of what is the poetry supposed to do as in function of poetry what forms are available for poetic writing and uh, what is the business of criticism so he, after worrying about poetry itself he wonders or he questions what criticism should do and he looks up to the masters as in like uh, as i said earlier he was interested in milton shakespeare fletcher and chaucer's works or even virgil and homer he was he was fond of all the classics right so he uh, discussed the masters he was interested in he combined both native and native tradition and the classical forms so even though just like ben johnson even though he was fond of uh, the native tradition as the english tradition native tradition would here would indicate english tradition the practice of the english writers he was also very much impressed by the classical works so he combined both and he also established a connection between his creative and critical works as in whatever creative writing he did whatever drama he wrote whatever poetry he wrote he based them on his critical works and whatever criticism he wrote he spoke about his creative writing his own creative writing all right the nature of poetry wondering about the nature of poetry aristotle's uh, defi definition is something he echoes okay what does aristotle tell about poetry po poetry is a process of imitation right poetry is something that imitates life so it imitates so what does it imitate it imitates what was or is facts past or present we've already discussed this we're going through it again because of dryden so it imitates what was or is that is the facts of past or present what is said or thought to be the popular beliefs and superstitions what ought to be is in things in their ideal form so first of all the poetry tells of what was or is as in all the historical poetry all all the things that uh, you know that are currently happening a poetry a poet talks about all of these in his poetry right so whatever happened or whatever is happening he would talk about that would be stating the facts right like a uh, child herald's pilgrimage or um something that talks about uh, see the plays the henry the fourth and all those things right poetry any poetry not not even speaks of the current affairs like um bernard shaw's writings all the, all the all the realistic novels speak of the current situation okay they may be imagined but they are based on facts right so it imitates what was or is is in something that states the facts past or present now what is said or thought to be as in something that is believed okay it could be just popular beliefs or some value system or some superstitions it could be any kind of belief okay whatever is said spoken or thought right so in that case you you could say um you know all those philosophical uh, poetry or even like uh, you know sentimental poetry or any kind of poetry for that matter they mainly deal with thought the thought process or what is spoken what ought to be as in things in their ideal form what should be this is what we need to worry about this is what life should be like when see poets present us pictures idealized pictures of what is um what what the possibilities are right a possible state of being see the ideal form as in a, a rose could be a little more red in the ideal form a, a woman could be more beautiful in terms of virtue right in the ideal form so we are talking about the poetry talks about what could be what is possible all right see for instance uh, shelley's adonis right or even david's michelangelo michelangelo's david sorry and these are all idealized forms right things that are perfect whereas perfection is not to be found anywhere so these give us utopian you know identities utopian nations for us to uh, to ponder upon and probably to work towards nature of poetry 
things as they were or are so we first of first off what was or, or, or is right things as they were or are main focus of his age past or present so during his time during dryden's time this was the prime focus things past or present they look for very similitude very similitude as in truthfulness so it's it was kind of like poetry was a measure of fact checking right you check the facts for its honesty so this was not a concern of dryden because it was already being practiced by everyone things as they are said or ought to be now except for he says a few instances shakespeare's use of the supernatural um one sec it, it's supposed to be thought to be here i made a mistake once again things as they are said or thought to be as in shakespeare's use of the supernatural founded on popular beliefs for it is still an imitation though of other men's fancies so he speaks of how things that are like you know believed or thought or uh, or perceived to be it was practiced by shakespeare during his Sha during shakespearean age or oh, like uh, you know how malov malov uh, relied on the supernatural element oh uh, so you see these two are for for extent practiced even during his time though not this not so much things that as they ought to be in the sense as this is something that is the idealized version of poetry is not found to be anywhere during dryden's time at least dryden believes so um so you see as truth is the end of all our speculations as the discovery of it is the pleasure of them and since the true knowledge of nature gives us pleasure a lively imitation of it either in poetry or painting must be of necessity produce a much greater for both these arts are not only true imitations of nature but of the best nature of that which is wrought up to a nobler pitch they present us with images more perfect than the life in any individual and we have the pleasure to see all the scattered beauties of nature united by a happy chemistry without its deformities or faults see he feels that we need to present truth in perfection to simply put it nature gives us pleasure through a lively imitation of it okay true knowledge of nature gives us pleasure and a lively, lively imitation of it either in poetry or painting must be of necessity produce a much greater see nobody would want to see a flawed picture at least that was dryden's belief so dryden believed that any kind of imperfection in painting is not to be tolerated okay not to be tolerated as in nobody would encourage that kind of painting or a picture right so even so in poetry since poetry is the art of imitation why create something that is flawed or deformed why not make it perfect so because only then we have the true kind of pleasure the real pleasure take it to the nobler pitch remove away the shades take away the shadows and you'll find it all complete or perfect so yes uh, this is something he was mainly concerned with he wanted poetry to give you idealized figures or uh, idealized portrayals of nature and men um i guess this is all for today i will continue tomorrow inshallah till then stay safe be happy thank you